Hello and welcome to this special program, Dialogue with the World. We are in Greece, at the island of Rhodos in the South Aegean. I'm Fanis Opathanasiou with the Greek public television ERT. And today with this uh, co-production with the Chinese CGTN, we're going to talk about the dialogue of civilizations. We are in Greece, the birthplace of democracy, and at this beautiful place in Rhodos, a very historic place, at the crossroad between Europe, Middle East and Africa, we're going to talk about modern democracy in the new international system. We're going to talk how ancient civilization, the Greek and the Chinese civilization, can contribute to the dialogue in the exchange in the new international system. Before I introduce you our interesting panel, I'm going to introduce you my co-host, Mr. Yang Ray, a distinguished uh, journalist from uh, CGTN, coming all the way from China Hello, for this Paris. important nice program. Very Thank nice to see you. Thank you for the nice introduction. I'm a humble student of a Greek civilization and a skeptical observer of the wax and wind of the major civilizations. It's a great honor and pleasure to discuss dialogue instead of clashes between civilizations. Uh, one hallmark in the post-Cold War system is the rise of a political Islamism. The other, the unpredictability of a populism in Western democracies. What does that mean for the values, faith, and institutions? Is new liberalism receding into history, and what are the alternatives? How do we look at functions of democracy in the transformation of some of the economies? I'm here waiting to see whether we can have a real debate and discussion. Next, uh, let me introduce our guest speakers on this side. Madam Chen Jiahong, head of research of DOC, and next to him is uh, Ying Godin former advisor to late South African President Nelson Mandela, currently professor from Oxford University. Welcome to our special program. And from here we have Eva Kaili, a member of the European Parliament, a Greek politician, a famous Greek politician, and Mr. Uh, Young Figel, former European Commissioner and special envoy of the European Union for uh, freedom of religion. So uh, you have the floor is yours for the first question. Let's start. Look, what inspirations uh, can we draw from Greece, whose glorious history and civilization may have laid the groundwork for Western institutions? Yet the rise of Asia may have provided a strong catalyst for a critical review of the West-centric and Anglo-Saxon dominance. I'm seeking a European solution, first of all, to this myth. We start from Ian Golden. It's incredible to be in the birthplace of democracy and reflect on the things that have happened here over many thousands of years. The Colossus that was not far from here that was destroyed over 2,300 years ago. And to think about the progress made. And I think what we at at the present time is another crossroads for humanity. This is a new renaissance. This is a period where because of the integration of the world, because of the rise of China, of emerging markets, the old powers are giving way to new powers. But in this process of transition, I think we're going through a lot of questions. And of course, politicians of national governments can no longer shape their own country's futures anymore. Because of integration, what affects every country even more dramatically comes from other places. So the tension between national sovereignty and integration is greater. And with that, I think we have real challenges to how we cooperate with each other going forward. Who would give answers, Mr. Golden, then? If not, if not politicians, if not leadership, who would give answers? I believe the answers will come increasingly from a wide range, from politicians amongst them. But I think what we're seeing is a real revolution in information, in science. There are more scientists alive today than ever before. We know more than ever in history. And I think we have to look at the evidence to get the answers. The challenge is to really understand how much we know. And on many things, we know so much more. The data is there. We need to act on it. Climate Madam change, Abba and uh, uh, Mr. Figel, are you clearly aware of the reasonable grievances uh, coming out of developing countries about the passing away of uh, Anglo-Saxon civilization over the past 500 years? The world is changing, we all agree, and we are responsible whether it's changing for better or for worse, because change is sort of permanent phenomenon. And we are just uh, ending time which was not so good 
in Europe or for the world. Uh, major world wars came out of Europe, uh, concentration camps, gulags, these were inventions of, of uh, dictators and used against humanity. I spoke here uh, today about century of genocides, which is, I hope, ending. I hope. If not, it will continue, which is the, the, the uh, crime of crimes committed by people against other people. Democracy is an uh, important history of Greece, uh, history of these places shows, but it must be based on values, not on numbers. Because if it is only demos ke kratos, or majority versus rest, or minorities, mm -hmm. it can lead to even <coughs> totalitarian... Values are indeed very important. Yes. It is a principle in shaping the future of the world. However, the issue is, uh, do we have a universality of the values? Here is the area where we seriously disagree, depending on what we are talking about, right? We have a world with uh, a multi-speeds. We have a lot of speeds, different speeds, and we have a lot of inequalities. And after the crisis of 2008, we saw these inequalities increase instead of decrease, and people turning against globalization in different ways, trying to become more nationalistic. We have Euroscepticism. So we have new balances that we have to find. I think, uh, though, in every crisis there are hidden opportunities, so maybe improving our relations and finding ways like the initiative of the One Belt, One Road could lead to a better understanding, a better balance, and maybe transfer the power to different and uh, more polar. So I think this is important also for the countries that have to benefit by the powers close to them. I wonder if my, my colleague, uh, Fanny, agree with me. Uh -huh. In your understatement, do you suggest clearly that the universal values which have been held so dear by Westerners are going to disintegrate and at least being rejected by the rise of populism and the next issue is whether we have a good democracy and bad democracy at the same time. We need to take a critical look at this. I wouldn't say the values, I would say the concentration of power will change. So this might affect the values, but I wouldn't say this changes because the values are there. It, uh, it depends who carries them and who is able to, um, to work with these values. So I think this is an opportunity to uh, maybe reinvent these values in a different way maybe have politicians that have a different mentality because we fail to protect citizens from this economic crisis when they felt really safe. So we have to create a new form of trust and I think being open to um, a better cooperation with, uh, since we now have a digitalization of the world, it's difficult to, to think with borders in our, in our heads. We have to keep an open mind okay. and Eva, start thinking you, in a different level. Are you comfortable with this? Are you comfortable with this transformation, with the speed of the globalization? Because you're an expert in the European Union and technology, and the mm -hmm. transformation of the technology and the globalization brings a lot of changes in technology, in economy, in policies, uh, in uh, the culture. Are you comfortable? Who is controlling this? Well, the good thing is that it can be completely decentralized, so this means you don't need to have a central control. This can be good if we see the potential there and if we're cautious and we are understanding not only um, the potential and the possibilities but also the threats. So if we manage to, to as I said, reinvent our values and try to, to correct our mistakes, then maybe we have a potential of having a more democratic world and to benefit from the, the best of the globalization but to avoid the worst. So if you have basically countries that couldn't connect, now you can connect. You, you thought you were alone in the whole world, now you can have friends all over the planet. You have to communicate with them. Yeah, it, it, it brings a lot of changes. Of course, it's, uh, we, every, everybody gets the benefit out of this. But yeah. are you, aren't you, are you comfortable with some changes that you cannot control uh, and uh, have no control in every aspect in your life, uh, let's say in technology? Uh, the way we're living anyway. Well, I would say that in some uh, cases it's, uh, it's for, for the best, in some cases there are more problems created. So being in the European Union, you see that you have to compromise to move forward. Sometimes you don't like the compromises. Sometimes you think the national uh, way of thinking is better. But sometimes when there is a problem with your government, you expect the European Union, for example, to solve it. So it depends. And that's why I think we have to reinvent new balances 
and this can only be for the best because we had a lot of problems that we didn't address properly so I think we have to move forward and with an open mind. Right, uh, the sitting next to uh, Dr. Chen Jiahong is the author of uh, Age of Discovery. However, I'd like to have a, a feministic perspective in our examination of uh, whether we have started or embarked upon the journey of rediscovery with regard particularly to mm -hmm. new value orientation. I'm looking at the issue in the context of the rise of Asia and Oriental cultures. Yeah, uh, great question. You know, actually, um, this reminds me of another uh, uh, very famous professor, Walter Kaufman. He once reminded us that, okay, uh, we are not rich enough to do stuff without going back to the tradition. So when we talk about values, we have to go back to see these great civilizations, how do they define values? Before they define value, how do they look at humanity? So we are facing all kinds of crisis, we all agree that, but at the heart of this crisis are humanity, the uh, humanity crisis, why humanity has been, you know, in a, such a uh, <coughs> risky uh, situation. I think if we look at the historical change, uh, Western historical change uh, from uh, Plato, from uh, Aristotle, and they all very much value the rationality of our human beings. So that is a, a very unique character characteristics of Western civilization. However, as you know, Enlightenment has promised us that all these scientific development are going to make humanity progress, but as a result, they failed. You know, from Enlightenment mentality, we could see that rationality has been pushed forward to this purely material pursue, which actually push humanity in the never-ending abyss of this kind of, you know... You seem to be quite critical of the, uh, what we call instrumental rationality in right. the age of consumerism. How detrimental will that be for exercising sound global governance in the 21st century? Mm -hmm. I think that, yeah, absolutely. We need, you know, balanced value perspectives. We need both, you know, instrumental rationality, which definitely is very helpful for human beings to make progress, to make scientific progress. But on the other hand, we need humanistic values, mm -hmm. which is very much uh, we Professor can find Chen, the root. Specifically, let's go to our topic anyway. Do mm -hmm. you think the ancient and the Greek uh, and uh, the ancient Chinese and the Greek uh, ancient uh, civilizations, if they brought together, can give a set of values? To, to give, to contribute to the international system uh, with the dialogue, with the exchange. Yeah, we Perhaps the, uh, the, the, the question for all of you is whether we are talking to each other or are we talking past each other in addressing the issue of a combination of both the Greek civilization and the uh, Oriental civilization. I think there's a big value in our tradition is about this all under the heaven which emphasizes inclusiveness instead of competitiveness, instead of, instead of competition. So we very much value this unity, unity of the heaven and earth, unity of the heart and the body, unity of everything. So if we go back to our very uh, uh, ancient philosophy, Taoist philosophy, they very, much say, okay, they very much value that, okay, actually we should go over, overcome with this ontological distinction between where a good or bad, self or other, we should just follow the way, follow the Tao, you know, this cosmological foundation. Are you alluding to the holistic view about perceiving the world? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So if, if we want to develop this inclusive, sustainable global development, we have to have this kind of all under the heaven perspective to get us. Um, a, a very spicy question for the uh, European observers here is, uh, whether we're going to have a constructive discourse uh, about uh, being together, living together, li let live, live and let live, for example, uh, instead of having the dichotomy of uh, right and wrong in black and white terms, we look at the future of the world uh, in a more inclusive way, and that is the essence of the Belt and Road Initiative, an advocacy for uh, by President Xi Jinping. Yeah, I love dialogue. This commissioner, I was responsible <laughs> for a European Year of uh, Intercultural Dialogue. 
because dialogue is more than a set of monologues. And to be more concrete, I think, I believe, I'm sure that first value which is important for all and everywhere is human dignity. We are all born free and with equal dignity and rights. When states, when societies recognize this human dignity for all and everywhere, we are on, on the track towards common answers, common ground, common interests. If this is the problem, that there is superiority of some based on race, based on religion, based on nation or whatever, then we have uh, divided societies and ideologies to run life or public, public power. Uh, Europe is full of lessons. Um, it's a very concentrated uh, place of history. We had religious wars, we had world wars here. Uh, I mentioned already ideologies of su superiority. But what we need and what we lear learned from these tragedies, fortunately, is a common good. Common good to live in peace and freedom and still with different interests, but there are also common interests. And instead of fighting, we negotiate. We, we try to find uh, compromise solutions. It's not perfect, but it's real. Okay, everybody 60 Mr. years Mr. of European Europe. integration is reality, which is a good answer to the world. Not perfect, but good. Okay. And of course, to us. Everybody in Europe is uh, talking about changes. Europe needs changes in order to go ahead to ne the next step, to continue to be there. What do you think is one change, one major change that can, be, uh, can work on uh, and it's a real need in the near future? Huh. There are many needed, but the basic change which is needed for several uh, areas of development, whether economic or monetary or political or security, is trust. If trust is present, we can find marriage, we can define many difficult but important solutions. If trust is missing, then we have a problem in everything. We are problem makers. And I think Europe needs more trust. Self-trust, but also trust around. And I hope that also this uh, uh, forum here can provide some trust building opportunities, because without that we are lost. And in more, more concrete terms, of course, we need to, to negotiate a uh, solution for Brexit. This is the issue. There are many questions inside of, of the community. I think and I'm sure that for future enlargement should continue because this was for 20 years the most influential European answer or solution for the division of the decades before. Uh, enlargement was not something extra or, you know, lobbyist, lobbyistic. It was reunification of divided continent for the sake of Europe, but also for the sake of the world. For our viewers in the, in the Asia that they don't know a lot uh, about Europe, uh, we have the rise of populists and extremists in uh, Europe. What do you think is the answer? Is it any answer on this? Well, first of all, let me say that we have uh, a tradition, China and Greece, of trade. And we used to be civilizations that would explore the world before any other did. So I think this is a very good example of ha having common fields and uh, we can have a common workshop, East and West, by using these countries and working better together. One thing that I would suggest is for people to travel more. So we have a lot of Chinese visiting Greece. That's and why we are here, uh, in Long Island. Exactly. <laughs> Not only for and uh, I still tourism. China. <laughs> <laughs> and we I, show I up still the tourism haven't industry visited. in the winter. Oh, she, haven't, she hasn't visited. No, so I think you it haven't will be visited not China? yet. How come? You <laughs> have to know. I give you the warm invitation <laughs> and you immediately okay. become a celebrity. You know, <laughs> uh, so this is the thing. It's not a tradition for Greeks to leave very easily their country and explore other civilizations. So, uh, and for Europeans, I think this creates these uh, silos of uh, Euroscepticism and of feeling that we have to be isolated from the world. So we have at least to make sure that Europeans will travel more, we have to make it easy, we have to, to open up to the rest of the world. I think this would change the whole mentality. A because couple there of weeks are some ago, you know, direct flights have been opened between mm. Athens and Beijing. Yes, I know. But you know, there are so many people, especially in the US, for example, that they have never traveled, and they are politicians, especially in the foreign policy and foreign affairs, that they had never traveled before. 
and these people decide for future, for the for wars, and they make extremely important decisions, and they do not even know geographically where some countries actually are, what are the, the religions there, and what are the differences. They believe that there is one religion. There are tens of religions in some, some areas of this okay. world. So I yeah. think this could be okay. a very good start. I will, I will suggest something. We will uh, send uh, Eva to China. You will bring a... Uh, like a million, a, a million start, Chinese a next thing year. I can assure okay. you, Fanny, is that I will definitely put her on our program, dialogue. Okay. Sure. <laughs> and, uh, and show her around in the funky building of our uh, office uh, here in the CBD, the bustling area in Beijing. Now, let me cite Professor Sammy Huntington as saying, in the emerging world of ethnic conflicts and the civilizational clashes, Mr. Golden, Western belief in the universality of Western culture suffers three problems. It is a fourth, it is immoral, and it is dangerous. Now, having said this, let me remind you, a few years ago, I was told that the majority of the lawmakers in the D.C. have never traveled outside the United States, and yet they assume world leadership. Isn't it a note of irony for the rest of the world? I think it is. Um, you don't have to have been somewhere to understand it. I happen to have been in China over 30 times um, and, and you know, worked in over 60 countries. But it doesn't mean that I'm more qualified than you uh, to talk about it. Uh, I think the question is how up to date are you? How much do you listen when you're there? How much do you observe? How much do you know about places, histories? Uh, so tourism is part of the answer and it's a wonderful thing, uh, but it's certainly Commerce is extremely important, and what globalization has really done is integrated economies and made us interdependent. We all contribute to climate change. We all can cause a pandemic. We all cause antibiotic resistance. We all destroy the oceans. And that interdependency, I think, provides my hope that we will change our ethical values. We also know a lot. We know that the European Union failed to monitor the diesel emissions from Volkswagen. You want to know why we don't trust institutions, because the financial experts brought us the financial crisis, the European Union regulators brought us the diesel scandal, etc. So we have to ensure that our regulators are fit for purpose, that we, our institutions evolve. I don't agree with Huntington's thesis on the class of civilizations. I think there's a lot of, a lot of uh, writing that shows that it's not uh, right. But there clearly are issues that we need to explore behind that. Now let me go back to Africa. African issues uh, seem to have been prioritized on the agenda of this uh, Rose Forum, the DOC. But uh, with the end of apartheid in 1995 and the free election 94. that delivered, 1994 of course, uh, which delivered uh, the presidency of Nelson Mandela, the economy in South Africa has uh, surprisingly declined, giving rise to a popular question and scrutiny severe scrutiny, whether Africans, I mean, black Africans uh, are able to run your economy effectively, or are you the victim of uh, Western colonial, colonialism? Uh, is that a, a bad legacy handed down from the whites? Yeah. What do just, you think just, of uh, just, just the clashes between the alleged yeah. African tribalism and the European colonialism? I think it's, it's important to lay the facts on the table. Firstly, uh, in the first eight years of Nelson Mandela's, uh, Nelson Mandela was president for five years and for a number of years after, the economy grew faster than in any period in the previous time. Inflation was controlled, there was extremely effective macroeconomic policy and capital flowed in dramatically. In the last ten years or so, under what I considered to be a very bad leadership of President Jacob Zuma, things have gone downhill and now we have growth rates in South Africa of one and a half or two percent. By the way, that's still faster than Europe is growing. Um, so uh, Africa contains five of the ten fastest growing economies in the world. If you look at the average growth rate of Africa, it's about 4.5%. You take our three badly performing economies, Nigeria, South Africa, and Egypt, and Africa's growth rate is much higher than any advanced economy region, is higher than Latin America, and is actually approaching Asian growth rate, which is quite remarkable. So I think it's very dangerous to characterize Africa as badly run. It's 54 countries, some are terribly run, some are amongst the worst run economies in the world, and some are actually the fastest growing economies in the world. Um, and it really does depend on the expertise. It is not, I believe, a race issue. 
I don't believe anymore we can bl blame colonialism either. That's an old story. Okay, Professor Chan, let's go back to China and talk uh, the relation uh, with uh, the West. Do you think there is mistrust between the United States and China, you know, in general, between China and the West? I think uh, since uh, late 1970s, China started its open door policy. We focus very much on uh, economic development, development, and. Uh, this could be one of the, if, if I'm wrong, you correct me, right? It could be one of the reasons that Chinese uh, government very much focus on internal development rather than uh, building, you know, uh, relationships with uh, foreign countries. Is that true? Um, in the presidency of uh, Xi Jinping, I believe he takes into consideration two worlds. One is the internal uh, governance, the other mm -hmm. how to shape our new uh, foreign relationship with the rest of the world. Because uh, we are rising fast, but is China trusted? Can we be taken seriously? Can we win easily recognition from the OECD countries because of the economic impact? These are the issues about not only uh, ideology, but also mm -hmm the Chinese model, whether we can call it the Chinese model. So is there a will of the uh, say the Chinese government to play a role in the international politics? Because, you know, economically is one of the leading powers. Does at the same time want to play a role uh, in diplomatic issues and political issues, in crisis in general? I think the big success for Chinese government is they really figured out how to develop a Chinese way of, you know, uh, to achieve this modernity. You know, there's so, so this model actually shows uh, people that there's not only one Western modernity model that people, all the other nations should follow. And uh, to me, Chinese uh, government should really, they have this uh, state-owned, you know, policy, but they, uh, mean, meantime, they also opened this uh, market. So I think they get very balanced way of managing, uh, you know, in terms of economic development and in terms of how to make the country really strong uh, at cultural level, at uh, uh, you know international relational uh, international relation level, or uh, holistically uh, looking at it, it has been a quite successful model. We will ask a question about uh, whether there is a trust between West and China. I think it's uh, more about. Uh, strategic transparency and strategic intent, uh, whether we believe crisis and dangers first and foremost come from within instead of from outside. Now China's uh, diplomacy serves to uh, work for the domestic economic reconstruction. Having just said this, let me go back to, the, uh, to Africa and uh, the alleged clashes between civilizations. Go back, let's go back to what happened when terrorist attacks occurred against Charlie Abdo, the satirical publication in Paris. Now, the Western, particularly French media, defended their absolute and unconditional freedom of speech, whilst the Muslims argue, by the way, the number of Muslims is growing so fast in continental Europe, and Muslims argue that there must be a limit to the freedom of speech, otherwise uh, the image of a Prophet Muhammad would be seriously humiliated. What do you think of uh, such a, a clash between uh, the Islamic world and the Western world? And in the opening remarks, I asked a question about the rise of uh, political Islamism, one hallmark that characterizes dynamics of the post Cold War institutions in the West. We should distinguish uh, cases because uh, to speak about Islam and Christianity or West uh, is one one large topic, and to speak about terrorism is a very specific and, and sensitive issue. Terrorists misuse religion, uh, abuse religion for their political or other power uh, aims. And this brutal misuse uh, uh, must be, you know, not only denounced, but, of course, uh, eliminated. We cooperate together in many formats, in the United Nations, in G20, and in, in other uh, uh, groups uh, on uh, promotion of security and fight against terrorism. One of the answers how to fight it in broader sense is education, knowledge, understanding, even relig religious literacy. Because if people don't understand, don't know, even don't care, then there is space, not only for terrorists, but for extremists, for populists, for xenophobes, and then we have an impact on politics. Um, I think that on these issues, we should be more united, because terrorism is inhuman behavior, 
history is full of examples of a different sort, of different source, sort of ideology behind. And now this is specific uh, ISIS type uh, uh, terrorism, uh, which on Middle East uh, cause uh, even genocidal situations, liquidation of whole groups of populations, whether Christians, Yazidis, Shias, or other minorities, and uh, of course cause a lot of mistrust in international relations. For example, in our case, European Union uh, provides very intense dialogue with Islamic countries. We are working together in Geneva, New York, bilaterally, multilaterally. Uh, it's also their, their interest. For example, last year, very great intention and declaration was adopted called Marrakesh Declaration, which speak about the principles important for Islamic majority countries vis-a-vis -vis minorities, because this is about the inclusiveness character or quality of democracy can be judged against, uh, according the, the quality or conditions for minorities. Majority is majority, whatever its, uh, its composition culturally, ethnically, but minority is treated fairly according justice and inclusively that's quality of democracy. Uh, one point of view by a Harvard professor says arguably that the post-Cold War era will be characterized by Western arrogance, Islamic intolerance, and cynic assertiveness. I wonder, Eva, you agree with this uh, analysis about uh, what's happening in this uh, process of uh, globalization? The result of globalization, so you feel suddenly that you are involved in everything, and everything that's happening to another country is in affects you. Uh, but I would also make sure to distinguish what is a religion and when you have fascism or terrorism. So these are uh, things that we have to keep separate. Um, we cannot talk about freedom of speech and forget about hate speech. But still, you cannot limit freedom of speech. Uh, this is a very dangerous discussion. Who decides how much freedom is enough? And at the same time, I understand democracy and I understand that in Europe we are very tolerant but you also have to make sure that people will respect women, life, children, um, they, they will respect our religion too. So this is uh, something that we have to figure out among us. And one thing that I understand, um, because I have, I have a friend that has been working with extremism, so she told me that the main problem of somebody joining ISIS, for example, is the lack of strong identity. It's the need of an identity. So I think starting this uh, dialogue in Europe and trying to show that there are uh, important uh, Muslims that they have benefited our society with their work, the character, and, uh, and all their lives, I think this is very important for, um, for the Europeans that have a different religion than the Christian religion or the Orthodox. They are um, Muslims, they are of a religion that they don't feel isolated in Europe. I think this is a main solution because if in globalization you feel threatened, you feel isolated, this might lead you to the extreme or you might look for another identity that is even beyond your borders. Or if it's just on the internet, this is where you play a very important and significant role, media journalists, and how you use the words and how you show what is Given happening. Given the predictable out there. outcome of the German elections, Angela Merkel, the Chancellor, still comes under huge pressure over the issue of uh, refugee crisis and immigration. Now, uh, a few years ago, both uh, uh, David Cameron, uh, Jacques Chirac, and perhaps uh, Angela Merkel all agree that the multiculturalism has failed in Europe. And look at the explosive growth rate of the Muslim population. Do you think European whites will be outnumbered and this will be uh, the beginning of the crisis? And do you think that is likely to trigger serious clashes between uh, Christian civilization and Islamism? This is also a discussion about the, demo the demographics of Europe and the world and how uh, things are developing. But this is something that we have to address. Uh, I think it's a, big pr it's a big problem that we're going to face in Europe. Um, the thing is that we should decide which point of view we will choose to look at it. And this is the most important. So we have to make sure that we will have people living together in peace and respecting each other and follow the rules and, and also have control of your borders. I'm against 
open borders. I, I believe we have to have control. We have to make sure that there is no tension created by um, the incapability of governments to control their borders and, and peace and to accommodate people that are in need of the refugees. But we I'm have to make sure that this is working. We're thinking about the harmonious coexistence between uh, Christian whites and the Muslims. But I agree that there are problems of different mentalities different cultures and different religions and that's why I said we should base our existence together in common respect of common values. And dialogue. And what your friend said about the identity is uh, right but uh, among others there, are, uh, there is a lack of other things of mo uh, like moral values and other uh, issues. But uh, let's talk, this is a very interesting topic, the populism, but let's go to Mr. Golding to talk about this issue because uh, populism will not happen in uh, Europe, we have in the United States as well, uh, which was on, uh, one of the issues that led the result on Brexit. So what is your take on this? I think it's a response to the underbelly of globalization, which means rising inequality and rising risk. And what people are seeing is that they are being locked out of the benefits. So inequality is rising very rapidly, and the more rapidly countries are integrating uh, with the rest of the world, the more rapidly uh, globalization affects this. Uh, some people do incredibly well. The dynamic cities are doing incredibly well. Low unemployment in places like New York, San Francisco, Chicago, Paris, London, Berlin, Munich, Frankfurt. But people cannot afford to live in these cities because the returns are so great. So one issue is how you deal with housing markets, transport systems, etc. Another is do the rich, the 1%, pay tax or are they offshore? Are there companies offshore? Uh, do governments have the capability to redistribute money? And that is reducing. Uh, the share of income of the top 1% in this period of globalization has increased dramatically. In the U.S. it's almost doubled since the late 1980s uh, from about 18% to well over 35%. And similar trends in, in Europe. And then the other is that we're seeing that integration leads to more risk. It leads to the cascading financial crises. It leads to concerns on terror. It leads to concerns about pandemics, about cyber attacks. So we need to, I'm a strong believer in globalization, by which I mean open and connected societies, but it does require that we do much more active government. We have to look after those left behind more actively, and we have to manage risk. Do you think, and what do you think just people, just people, on, people on China in Europe in the United States got the message China's picking of up. What do you mean by China is picking up? Yeah, I think up. people in the U.S., you know, the people that voted for Trump... Is that uh, a philosophy of your win is my loss? No, I'll, I'll come to that in a second. In, just on Trump, in, in the yeah, U.S., Trump there's a very America strong first. relationship uh, between those left behind in the Midwest. Their life expectancy is going down. You know, the work has been done recently which shows that globalization has not improved these people's lives. Their unemployment rates are higher. Their life expectancy is lower. Their chances of moving home are lower than their parents. They are not benefiting from globalization, and it's not a surprise, they say, let's retreat. That is, of course, a wrong perception because we're not connected, we're entangled. There's no wall high enough that will keep out climate change or pandemics or the shocks, and it will keep out two things. It will keep out the solutions and the people that will help the solutions, and it will keep out cooperation. And this cooperation that needs to solve problems. Just on China, I was uh, in, in Davos when President Xi made this most By the remarkable... Way, you, you came to China almost every year since 1984. <laughs> That's right. I've done my homework. <laughs> yes, good. Uh, and I was there to launch Very my book that Siddiqui, that Siddiqui has uh, produced, uh, Age of Discovery, uh, translation. But I think 2017 will go down as the year where China finally became a global leader. Every time up to, and you say I've been there since 84, every previous visit, China said we've got our own problems we have to focus on, and the world does not, is not wanting us to play a more active role. If you look at President Xi's speech, basically, I think what he said is China cannot succeed unless the world succeeds. We have to defend uh, integration. We have to deal with global shocks like climate change, like pandemics, like others. And I think it's the most remarkable thing. And when we look at this year in history and China, there will be many things, the growth of China, etc. But the most important thing, will China accepting it needs to play a shared role in global political leadership. For your encouraging analysis about what the future might hold for China, I give you a warm invitation to come over to China again. again. I'd like to again. again.
program oh, dialogue. Yeah. Yeah, you're going to invite everybody. <laughs> <laughs> no exceptions. No, ex no Chinese exceptionalism, by the way. We are the witness, okay? <laughs> you have to deliver a promise. Right. Okay, <laughs> let's go to Mr. Figure now. Mr. Figure, let's talk about the Catalonian crisis. Uh, some people in Europe fear that uh, is uh, uh, might create uh, bigger problems than Brexit. What is your take? You know, difficult to compare and difficult to predict future, yeah? <laughs> but um, when Czechoslovakia uh, split, there was idea, the, the, the main line was to reintegrate around European Federation, European community. And I, I was very, very close to this process as chief negotiator on the side of Slovakia to join the Union and then as the first commissioner inside of the enlarged Union. I think uh, Spain and Catalonia need kind of positive and joint vision. Uh, it's uh, for them to define, but uh, of course, on the one side, we should respect the uh, right for self-determination. It's one of the political rights in current modern history. On the second uh, side, this should and must be implemented according to the rules. Otherwise, it cannot work. And this is constitution of Spain and, and political agreements within uh, Spanish society and uh, political structures. So we wish that this process is really peaceful, reasonable, uh, and, and fruitful in positive sense. Um, because, uh, you know, there are different cases, and I mentioned one because I know it. I lived half my life in Czechoslovakia, and now I live in Slovakia and the European Union, and we have all issues, questions with Czech checks uh, settled, there is no real uh, division or, or uh, tension. Uh, but basically it's uh, homework of uh, Spanish people, Spanish uh, 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 society uh, with due respect to what happened recently, with uh, serious and I would say even more mature approach to the next steps, because it was not mature enough to see it as um, productive or promising. The Chinese uh, uh, do not support the independence of Taiwan, the independence of Tibet, or the independence of the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region. We stand for reunification of a motherland. Do you see the, uh, the Chinese strength in cementing the solidarity and in holding the whole world together? What is the essence of the Chinese soft power? The core of Chinese culture, as we know, that we very much emphasize the, the unification of heaven and man. And uh, in Chinese, we call it Tian Ren He Yi. It's about unification. So, also, according to no matter Confucius' idea or Tao's idea or Buddhist idea, all of them share a common, uh, common idea, which is uh, uh, the two realization of humanity cannot be separate from our relationship with you, with you, with society, with nature, with heaven, with everything. So that's going, uh, could also echo to what I have mentioned uh, from beginning, which is about all under the heaven. So unification, unity in the diversity, which is a very much central idea about Chinese culture. In this way, it's not hard for us to understand why Chinese so much concerned about to, you know, unite Taiwan, Hong Kong, Macau, uh, uh, Tibet, all together. There's so. no question about the unity or unification between and among all the ethnic groups in China, of course, with Han accounting for 95% of the population. The issue is whether the rest of the world feels comfortable with having a with the Chinese having very central government. The central authorities would uh, say, hey, the buck stop here in Zhongnan Hai, and they would uh, call for democracy. In China, Daniel Bell, a professor from mm -hmm. Tsinghua University, mm -hmm. says, look, what China practices uh, since the uh, opening up is uh, the uh, meritoc the, the, the vertical democratic meritocracy. <laughs> 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 and uh, that's repeated and agreed upon by uh, John Nesbitt, author of Mega Trends, uh, he also agrees that uh, the vertical democracy or consultative democracy might be a very convincing alternative, if not a replacement of the Western institutions, uh, which emphasize on uh, the virtues of a competitive democracy. Okay. What are your thoughts? Mm, absolutely. I think uh, just like uh, the 
the concept of democracy itself actually has evolved and has to be you know, uh, investigated in the context. So that's why we have, right now we have the new vocabulary about how to, about globalization and the localization. This is very much to see all these big concepts of democracy, freedom, human rights, modernity, all have to be looked at through their own, you know, local context. And actually, I would say uh, in China, China's democracy actually is, uh, we would say it's, it's more advanced than Westerners to look at us, right? We very much, uh, you know, promote this non-instrumental uh, values. If we see democracy is too abstract, but we need to see all these values associated with the concept. We promote win-win, you know, mentality, win-win policy, which is a way to promote this concept, okay, right? Let's, let's go now to Mr. Golding to talk about Brexit. And mm -hmm. uh, people in Europe, but all over the world, this Mr. is a great leap forward from China <laughs> to the Brexit. Of course, <laughs> because China is everybody. Globalization, you know, brings us together <laughs> in a village. So, so Brexit would bring us together. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so everybody is questioning and uh, is is wondering why is, uh, is people in Europe, all over the world. Uh, uh, read differently the message of Brexit in, uh, of the British people. Yeah. Again, I it's uh, about the disintegration, right? Yeah. I think what, um, what Brexit reflects uh, is populism, is this nationalist tendency. Uh, I think there are a number of things happening here. It wasn't London or the south of England that's dynamic and doing incredibly well that voted for Brexit. It was places it, where there are very few immigrants that benefit hugely from the European Union, like the farmers in Cornwall and Wales. It was the car factory workers in Sutherland, which is 95% dependent on supply integration with Europe. So people voting against the economic interest, but people feeling left out. They cannot go to London where the jobs are. House prices are too expensive. The congestion is too bad. I think Britain has also lost its empire. It's an identity crisis. It's a slow, slow transition to being the leading country in the world, to being, you know, we, if we'll be lucky if we're in the top ten soon. Uh, the U.S. is going through a similar sort of crisis. And so it's a psychological realization and I think there's also a huge cynicism around experts and authority and that comes from the financial crisis the question I would pose is would there be Brexit would there be Trump without the financial crisis and my answer is no this was a failure of institutions which people are revolting against so the world is not more flat as my friend Tom Friedman suggests the world is much more mountainous being in the right place at the right time with the right skills matters more than ever and if you're not if you're in the valleys if you're left out you feel left out you want to understand why countries are breaking up there's a hundred new countries in the world over the last hundred years thirty over the last thirty years because we don't redistribute money like China does uh, to different regions because some places are doing incredibly well and dynamic and the people in some regions like Scotland and Catalonia are sending more money back into the rest of Spain. They feel that they're not being treated fairly in the deal. Thomas uh, Friedman, now, whether it's forward, right or wrong Thomas is a different Friedman matter. Also put yeah. forward the idea of uh, the world becoming not only flat but also overcrowded uh, with Europe uh, being an example. Uh, Eva, do you think where does Europe stand? We try to draw inspirations from European integration by forming what we call the Asian community, the Asian common market, and yet what we see ironically is the beginning of demise for the European integration. Eva, would you come up with a European solution? Well, first of all, just let me correct something. I don't believe in Catalonia it was the majority that wanted the independence. Uh, but I understand that uh, the populism, this means the rhetoric that is out there through fake news, misinformation, this is something that can trigger big crises. So I think one of the problems of the UK was misinformation. They actually thought that they were losing something being in the European Union. They are realizing very slowly that uh, it's, it's the opposite, that they had a lot of investments in research, in science, exports. We were a big market for, for um, UK people. And now UK citizens uh, uh, understand that uh, the citizens that are abroad, they cannot benefit uh, uh, the way they were when they were traveling around. So it, they understand it. So I think this is one 
part of the problem. This globalization creates a lot of misinformation and it's not very easy to educate people how to trust and who to trust. I do think so the media takes the blame for doing uh, a out big part of a big, a, big part of, a big part of the problem. And the second, of course, as I said, is inequalities. Because we have changed, uh, we took everything for granted and suddenly we forgot where we were 50 years ago and we expect and we compare ourselves to the best. So I think this is, I think this is a really important. I have a suggestion. Let's send an international message here from uh, Rodos. From the heartland of European democracy. Okay, Greece. better Let's democracy Greece. A, uh, Something for a project, message. Benzinch project, uh, one belt, one road, a silk road. Mr. Golden first. I think Europe will benefit immensely from closer relations with China. The center of gravity of the world is going back to what it was in the Renaissance. Uh, and what we will see with this is that basically Europe, together with Asia, China, India is also growing strongly, are going to become the new center of gravity politically, economically, and in terms of ensuring that this planet is sustainable. I just want to repeat to our President Xi's word is that we are living the worst age where we all facing all kinds of crises, but we are also living the best age. We can sit here, we can discuss, we can be so open-minded to talk about all the rooted reasons of this crisis and find the solutions which should be at the global level. This is a cyclical issue about whether China should make a comeback 500 years on. <laughs> <laughs> I think things can only go better from now on. I think uh, we have, uh, we can do more together than we can do apart and maybe this is the main message that uh, being in the European Union is uh, that I can transfer to you. That being together we can do more, we can achieve more than uh, being apart. The European Union is not in demise. UK was not founding country and uh, I'm sorry for the decision but it's part of experience for both. Uh, the European Union became global actor and partner to China and many, many important countries. I think that these uh, connections or mm -hmm. connectivity via roads and, and belt is a good idea. It will need a lot of investment and work, but it uh, will uh, get us closer. And I think it can then uh, promote the idea of one world, one humanity. And for us, these issues we discuss here, like human dignity, are questions and principles of justice. And justice is a common good. And here I must quote Confucius. When I became parliamentarian, in my first speech, I, I quoted Confucius. When words lose their meaning, our, our human freedom is under threat. So these ideas, principles of Confucius, of wisdom, of uh, values which are uh, timeless, are important for all Thank generations you, and for all, all people. Thank you so much. What we did here is a dialogue. Uh, the name of your show is Dialogue. So we did dialogue, a dialogue on civilization from this here. beautiful place and in Rhodos. So what yes. we did here is working together, the Greek ERT with the Chinese <coughs> CGTN. So let's be the beginning of cooperation, of uh, exchange of dialogue, of views among ancient civilization, about modern democracy, about uh, values, about issues that concerning your country, my country. Well, Anglo-Saxon people keep asking the question about uh, make or break in the process of a regularization. The Chinese would emphasize, in sharp contrast, the issue of uh, to be or not to be. That's a very philosophical issue and uh, one of the multiple challenges we are facing in reconstructing a collective future of the world. With that, we come to the end of this edition of a Dialogue with the World in partnership with the ERT. Thank you for being with us. Thank and you. I hope to see you tomorrow, not tomorrow, next year in Beijing. Okay, we're going to be there. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Vanish.